introduction. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here, especially seeing this wonderful colloquium. So, you know, my title had something on the mysteries of the abelian sand pile, and that's uh, the process you're seeing here. So I'll come back to that uh, later in the talk. The So what I'll be discussing is connected to work of many people, but my part of it is, has all been joined with Lionel Levine, who is just uh, is starting soon a, at Cornell, uh, an assistant professor at Cornell. And um, so, so let me start. So this topic of Laplacian growth has many, uh, many different origins. Uh, one of the more famous one is connected to DLA, diffusion limited aggregation, where you have particles coming to infinity and create from infinity and creating some fractal structure with fingering. Um, I really won't be discussing that at all, but rather some kind of process that can be thought of as a time inversion or spatial inversion of that, which is smoother, much easier to analyze and still with a lot of interesting connections and still uh, mysteries that I will emphasize, uh, especially so those especially with some familiarity with conformal mapping will have some nice mysteries to uh, encounter. So one of the origins of this topic, there are many, is a, a operation of addition defined by Diaconus and Fulton. So this is a way to add two sets in the lattice. The sum uh, will be a random subset of the lattice. Um, okay, so so how is this operation defined? Uh, let me first show it in a picture and then come back to the formal definition. So again, have, so in this picture there is a fine lattice that you don't see, uh, and in this lattice here we're trying to add these two squares. Now, if the two squares were disjoint, the sum would just be the union. If the sets are not disjoint like this, the sum will be a new set whose area is the sum of the the sum of these the sum of these sets, the sum of the areas of these sets, and it's created as follows. So we look at the intersection here. This uh, this set is the intersection, and every point here um, we think of having an extra particle. So really think of adding the indicator of this square and the indicator of that square. So what you'll get is one on the symmetric difference and two on the intersection. So the two you think of as two particles. And of these two particles, one is happy where it is and one wants to find its own place in the world. So it starts making a random walk. So take a particle here, it starts making a random walk till it exits and finds an unoccupied spot and it settles there. And it owns that new spot. Then we take another particle and it walks around till it finds an unoccupied spot and settles there and so on. And you keep going until you've exhausted all the particles in the intersection and every particle has found its own spot. Okay, that's the rule. Um, so, so formally, that's what here. If the intersection is x1 to xk, to form a plus b, you start with the union, but then you take these points x1 to xk in some order. You let x1 make a random walk, and y1 is the endpoint of that random walk, and you just add that to create c1. Then you take x2, make it do a random walk, and it settles at a new spot, which you call y2, and so on, until you get the sum. Now, this does not appear to be properly defined because I didn't tell you how to order the intersection. The nice thing already pointed out in this original paper by Diaconis Fulton is that it doesn't matter. So the distribution of the random set you get doesn't depend on the order of the particles. And this is surprising at first, but actually very easy to verify if you think of uh, just two particular steps that they... Uh, that you, if you change the order, you don't change the result. You have to be careful about what the result means. So we're looking at this, at these final results as sets. Not we don't care about the where particular particles went. So when you change the order, you know one particle that was destined to go here might go to the other place, and so they might swap positions. But we don't care about that. We'll, we do, particles here don't have distinct identities. Okay, so that's this operation of Deacon's Fulton addition and. Perhaps the uh, first thing to be considered there was what happens when you add just a point to itself many times. So, 
which is known as internal DLA. So many of you know the story, but um, I'm going to switch gears for a moment and tell you about this something similar, but where the the rules are exactly the same, except the walk is deterministic rather than a random walk. So let me show you. Um, so different. Okay, want to go here? A very similar process, except it's deterministic. So this will be a process with absolutely no randomness, but surprisingly, it's still interesting. So you look at. Um, so here is the process. We start with a uh, square at the center, and so the one particle at the center, and we add particles always at the center, and they move till they find their own unoccupied spot, but the way they move is first the rotor, that arrow we call the rotor, rotates by 90 degrees to the right, uh, you know, clockwise, and then the particle moves and settles in this spot if it's unoccupied. New particle starts, moves, settles in this occupied spot, unoccupied spot. Okay, each time a particle starts at the center, it rotates the arrow moves there. This spot is still occupied, so the arrow will be rotated. Particle moves and settles there. Okay? Here, I'll do a few more. So you, I hope the rule is understood. So it's similar to what I told you before. The difference is there's no random walk here. Each time a particle reaches a spot, if it's occupied, the arrow rotates, and then the particle moves until it reaches its own spot. Okay, so I can move it a little faster. Each time I press the button now, a particle starts at the center and does the whole trip till it found its unoccupied spot. Okay, and one question is, if I keep going, what shape will I see? Any guesses? Is it about a square, a circle, a triangle, a fractal? So let's run it faster and then the answer becomes clear. This is becoming a circle. And in fact, as we'll see later, it's an amazingly perfect circle. So we have some theorems now that it's a circle, but the reality is much more profound and much more precise than anything we can prove. So I promise you'll see more of that later. Okay, so let me go back to the... to what I was describing. All right, so if we do the same thing I showed you in the simulation, but with random walks, this was analyzed earlier, and Lawler, Branson, and Griffith in 92 uh, proved that in the random walk case, the limiting shape is a, is a ball, and this is, uh, and this is a simulation of that with one million particles. The color at every site represents what's the direction that the last particle left the site. Here it's all random walks, so these colors look pretty random. You see that it approximates a disk, but those who look closely at the boundary can see the boundary fluctuations. So there are, you know, it's not a perfect disk, as you could guess from the random walk description, but it's pretty close. So the original paper just showed that it's asymptotically a disk, uh, and I guess here's a formal statement. If you look, uh, given a number n, you find the radius of a ball which will have the same number of points as n, and then the set a n that you get will be contained in a slightly smaller ball and be contained in a slightly larger ball. Here, the slightly smaller and larger is multiplying by 1 minus epsilon or 1 plus epsilon. This has since been more made more precise, for instance, in two dimensions. After n particles have arrived, the radius is, of course, a constant root n. And the fluctuation was first proved by Lawler to be about n, at most n to the 1, 6. And very recently in two uh, parallel works, um, one by Godillier, who's here, and is, is he here? And your, remind me the name of your co-author. Asela and Godilia, thank you. 
Uh, and another work by uh, Levine, <coughs> Sheffield, and Jerson established uh, the correct order of fluctuations here, which is uh, logarithmic in two dimensions, and uh, there's also a more precise square root log in higher dimension, right? I, I have the papers down here. Um, so that's a beautiful issue to improve these error bounds, but it's not the issue I'll emphasize in this talk. The rotor router model is, or the, is what I showed you in the simulation. So you have these rotors that in the plane they po point north, south, east, or west. And again, as I showed you, you turn the rotor clockwise and you take a step in the direction of the rotor. And then we have a sequence of lattice regions. Each one is obtained by adding one new point and seeing where it lands. And this uh, model was proposed by Jim Prop, who looked at the simulation, saw it also looked like a disk. He already knew about the uh, result on internal DLA. But this is how uh, the this model looks, the rotor router model looks after one million particles. So there are two features here. One, well, it's a disk. Two, um, it seems like a perfect disk. Three, it seems like there are no holes. And four, there's this wonderful pattern of colors inside. So remind you, the colors are just the direction of the arrows, namely the direction the last particle left every site. And, um, so of these four issues, all we know is basically <laughs> it converges to a disk. We have some error bounds. They're very far from the truth. So showing that there are no holes, showing that how perfect a disk it is, showing understanding this pattern of colors is all an open problem. With the pattern of colors, we do ha uh, know that it's related to the conformal map square root 1 over z, but this knowledge is kind of by pattern matching, not by mathematics yet. Though, you know, maybe there'll be progress on that. Um, anyway, so I'll, I'll tell you something more about this. And uh, so, three, four years ago with uh, Lionel Levine, we did get the answer Jim Prop's question and show that there are spherical asymptotics for this. The error bounds we got are logarithmic for the inner error. So if you have, right, so, so given uh, given n particles, you calculate the relevant radius r, which, where the ball would have volume n. And then the set a n, the set you get, contains a ball which is slightly smaller. You just have to reduce the radius by a logarithm. So we were quite proud of this result. And then we're you know, not as happy with the outer error because here there is a power law correction. So I have to multiply r by something that tends to 1, but a... Uh, but for, but for instance, in the plane, this if r would be root n, and the error would uh, <coughs> the error turns out to be n to the one quarter. So it's uh, the error is actually quite large. What we can prove. So, but still, at least we know it's a disk in the sense that the in radius or it's a ball. The in radius of the out, over the out radius certainly tends to one with some error bound. Yes. How do you define the uh, rotation of the, of the rotor? In, in higher dimension. Yeah. So, so one thing is, the picture was made with a very specific pattern. The results are more robust than that. So if you order the neighbors of a site in any order, anyway. and you just go in order, and the order doesn't have to be the same for different sites. It could be different orders for different sites. And all the results are robust to that. The perfect roundness depends on this choice of details. The perfect roundness we see in simulations. Uh, but the theorems are... So this, one is true. this theorem is very robust, but the air, but with big, uh, you know, these big air bounds. In fact, all you need for this, you don't even need to go through the, them in order. All you need is that if I wait for any time n, the fraction of times I sent the particle to each of the... or the number of times I sent the particle to each of the 2D neighbors is the same up to an additive constant. So, so you can vary it a lot, and this theorem holds uh, under those conditions. The, but the beautiful patterns will be destroyed if you go to that generality. Now, what's that? <laughs> okay. Well, when we start at one point, 
Okay, there's not that much, and especially if you think of the random walk, the IDLA, then we know random walks after a long time have spherical symmetry, so we're not surprised by getting a disk. But what if we start at two distinct points and uh, let the particles evolve from them? So, um, all right, let me try and show you one more simulation. Too much. Okay, so here we start at two different centers. Okay, and eventually, initially we get disks, but then the disks start to merge and we get some different shape. Now, the way I'm running the simulation, I fix the starting points and I'm letting, adding more and more particles, and if we wait for long, this will still converge to a disk. So to get a different, more interesting asymptotics, what you should do is start n particles at this site and n particles at a site which is c root n away, where c is a small constant. And now let n tend to infinity. And then you'll get a different picture depending, which depends on, on this constant c. But in this simulation, we add more and more particles and keep the initial distance the same. So this will, if you wait long enough, converge to a disk. So the simulate the picture I showed you was right, so we start here, you know, some distance which is you know about a le, less than a thousand away and we put you know a million particles at each site and see what happens. So we get this shape. So there's several questions. What is this shape? Can you describe it? And that we can do. Why is the boundary so smooth? This we can't understand. And how is this pattern surviving all this interaction? This we are totally puzzled by. But it's there. Okay, so I remind you, this pattern is the direction of the arrows. Uh, so these colors represent the direction of the arrows. And what you are seeing are large areas that are not macroscopic, but they are mesoscopic. So they're intermediate scale between the whole disk and a point where all the arrows are pointing in the same direction. And that's what creates a pattern. So there's these patches where arrows have somehow agreed on the direction and we don't really understand how they reach that agreement. Yes? Do a point where we start on the left at this point, passing through the point on the left, do they actually get that point? They not all just go up? Um, they you know, uh, they, they, do, they do have some chance to interact and the funny thing is you can affect that process because where individual particles go is not determined. It's determined by the order and you can choose the order to make a particle from the left travel quite far. But it doesn't change the pattern. So you can also choose the order where they don't travel far. Okay, now the same thing, can, the same rule can be used to define a, this rotor rotor rule can be used to define an addition operation, which will now give, from two sets, give a deterministic set. So this shape which I described to you can also be thought of as adding two disks, because you can first create one disk from one point, then another disk from the other point, and then add them in the sense that the points in the overlap have to now find their own positions, and the commutative nature of all of this shows that you will get the same. Yes? Yes? Um, this is a great question which is not fully resolved. So we, we know the average. So the average is like for random walk, but the, there are much bigger fluctuations of the time and it's not fully understood. Uh, maybe... Uh, uh, so I'm... I'm I don't have a good answer for you. Let's, but but it's 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 a very good question to understand better. Okay, so let's look at the. This is the same rotor rotor addition, but for two squares. So again, you see a pretty similar set, maybe less wild. And then the red points are the new points that the particles arrived. It's the same rule on the intersection. The particles start walking till they find their own positions. 
Okay, well, to understand these two models, it turns out that the best idea is to introduce yet a third model. So, I'm promising to limit, uh, <laughs> to limit your intake today to just four models. So, these are, you've seen two. This is the third, the divisible sand pile, and the abelian sand pile, most mysterious, will come at the end. So, this divisible sand pile is actually the cleanest and most well understood of the models, uh, because here we don't have particles, we have continuous mass. And every, all the division into neighbors is perfect. So we start with some large mass M at the origin. Each site keeps, each site that has more than mass one keeps mass one to itself and divides the excess beyond one equally exactly among the neighbors. Okay, so, so the first, the origin which will ha which has mass m sends m minus 1 over 4 to each neighbor. Assuming that's still bigger than 1, each of those neighbors will send, a, will keep mass 1 to itself, and the excess above 1 will divide equally among the neighbors and send it, and, and, and you keep going. Now, say you keep going, actually, if you look at this in terms of these discrete time steps, you'll keep going infinitely off for infinitely many steps, because if you look at the origin and its neighbor, they will keep sending smaller and smaller maps to each other forever. But this process does converge. So if you take, keep sending all the mass and look, go to the limit, you will get a limiting region. <coughs> and again, there's this commutativity property. So you could say, well, should I look at all sites of mass bigger than one and have them move? in a synchronized way, or maybe first this one, and then that one, and then this one. As long as you keep visiting every site again and again, the limit is not affected by that. Okay, so again, these things are, are maybe surprising at first, but when you look at them, the commutativity of individual steps, if you look at it the right way, is not hard to prove, and this is all in papers that are published and accessible on the archive, so if you want to see the details, uh, they're, they're there. But this is not hard at all. So here's the theorem which is actually easier than the ones about IDLA and Rotoruta, which is for this model, the shape you get starting from a large mass M uh, will be contained in a slightly larger ball and contained in a slightly smaller ball, where here you see there is a constant additive error. Okay, so this model is really easier to analyze than the other ones. Here's a picture, and again you see a perfect disk. But I should say, it doesn't look more perfect than the one for the rotor. It just is, can be proved to be perfect up to this additive error. Uh, the other one is still not, but, uh, okay. The, so this is what you get from this model. And you can also use this rule to add two sets. So again, here are two squares in the lattice. We add their indicators, so we get mass 2 on the intersection, mass 1 on the symmetric difference, and every point with mass bigger than 1 sends a quarter of the excess to the neighbors. And you keep going, and in the limit, you get uh, this shape, which is the union of the original squares, together with this red point, which is where mass spilled over. In general, as I said, in the limit, you get a region of, uh, in the, you know, some set in the lattice of mass 1, then on its, uh, on its outer vertex boundary, you'll get some fractional mass between 0 and 1, and then beyond that it's 0. So that's what, uh, that's what you'll get. Now, here are these three pictures together when we try to add two squares. This is the original Diaconis photon addition, which is a model for IDLA, the random rule. This is the rotor rotor rule, and this is the divisible sand pile rule. And, well, these pictures, besides such the fluctuations, they look somewhat similar, so this suggests some questions. So, when we add two sets, as the lattice spacing goes to zero, is there a scaling limit? Can you describe what it is? Is it the same for all the models? And, well, okay, so one natural approach, which looks doable, but just hasn't been done yet, is to describe a continuous time and space dynamics in Euclidean space, some uh, PDE, which will describe this time-space scaling limit of all these processes. So there are some candidates, but we're not there yet. What we do have is a 
continuing description of the limiting set. So we don't have a good description of the whole process, how things topple. That's a little delicate because of, you have to choose the order. But in the end result has this invariance, and that we understand. Well, and the key to understanding it is to look at this function, the odometer function. So u of x is the total mass emitted from x. And the reason we call it odometer is originally we were most interested in the rotor rooter model, and there, uh, you know, u of x over 4 measures how many times this rotor rotated around the point, right? So it's like a car odometer turning around and around. So, so we use this, this terminology in general, but u of x is the total mass ever emitted from the site x. Note that there is not, we're not looking at net mass. We're not subtracting anything. This is the total mass emitted from x. And, okay, so that's this function u. In particular, it's non-negative. We're going to use that. But if we do want to subtract, we look at the discrete Laplace of u. And note there are many normalizations. So the one we'll use is a kind of probabilist normalization where we divide by 1 over, we divide by 2d. And so the Laplace of u at x is uh, the average of u at the neighbors minus the value of u at the x. Okay? And with that definition, what does this mean? Let's look at, for the divisible sand pile, it means exactly the mass received at x minus the mass emitted from x, because u of x is a mass emitted, and every neighbor sends exactly 1 over 2d of its mass, if we're in d dimensions, to, to x. All right, so... So we can say what it is when we're adding two sets A and B. It's minus one if points are in the intersection because there you start at mass two, you get it, you get to one. Uh, on the symmetric difference, it's zero. And on the outside, it's one. So what is this outside? So A plus B is my notation for the final sum set that we're going to get. And, uh, and on that sum set, we started at mass zero, we end with mass one. So that's why we get that value. Now there's something I didn't write here for a reason, but it will be important, that outside, outside the sum set A plus B, well, there's this thin boundary where you get some fractional behavior. I'm ignoring that for now. But then on the outside, you're just going to get zero because no mass is received, no mass is emitted. That is what causes the problem because this is some difference equation but it's a difference equation of the free boundary type because what we're trying to solve for is where is the boundary between this value 1 that we got in A plus B and the value 0 that we get on the outside. So when we got this kind of thing, it was natural to suspect that this free boundary difference equation will converge if we scale things correctly to a free boundary PDE, which is a heavily sub studied subject. But these, you know, when we first asked some of our PDE friends about this, they said, oh, well, these free boundary PDEs are bad news. But then when we asked the right friends, they said, well, particular, uh, I should thank uh, Craig Evans from UC Berkeley, he said, well, but the particular PDE you're getting is just the classical obstacle problem for the Laplacian, which, for which Caffarelli has built a beautiful and very precise theory, and if you just you know, learn that and adapt it to your case, you should be in good shape, and that prediction was exactly right. So, so the key method to handle this kind of PDE is what's known as the method, method of the uh, superharmonic majorant. And, you know, we didn't know it when we started, and I'm not going to assume you know it, but I'm going to start by describing what this method does just in our discrete case. So this is, I'm kind of inverting the historical order. Um, so, okay. So what do we do with this difference equation? The idea is first to ignore the free boundary and say, suppose that this one that we have on A plus B minus A union B extended you know, out to all of space. So we're kind of ignoring the most important feature of the problem, which is the free boundary where things change, but it will pay off. So let's write this in a different way. So what we have here, delta U, right? So um, this, this minus one at the intersection means that uh, we're getting you know, 1 minus indicator A minus indicator B. And this is when ignoring 
when ignoring this uh, boundary. But if we would extend just that one to the outside, then uh, we'll just get, right, if this one holds everywhere outside the union of A and B, then we just have the equation Laplace in U equals that. Okay? So, it is, let's first ignore this feature and then see what that gets us. So, so the nice thing, this equation with no free boundary, with no kind of boundary, unknown boundary where things change, this can be solved explicitly. Because if you know that the inverse of the Laplacian is convolution with the Green's function. So, so here's the formal uh, solution actually of, um, so, so actually minus gamma, okay, so this is solved by minus gamma. Well, gamma is given by that formula. Okay, so the quadratic x squared has Laplacian in our normalization. The Laplacian is exactly one. So, the, so x squared will give you the one. And now this green function, well, what is this green function? If you're in dimension greater or equal three, you can easily say what it is. G of x, y is the expected number of visits to y by a random walk that starts at x. And because the random walk is transient, this will be some finite number. That's gxy. But really what's important for us is not the property, that property of gxy, but how the Laplacian behaves. So the green function is harmonic everywhere except in the diagonal where the Laplacian in our normalization is a minus Dirac at the diagonal. And if you characterize the green function that way, then there is an analog in two dimensions. The analog in two dimensions is known as the negative of the recurrent potential kernel. You can read about that, say, in the book by Spitzer on random walk or uh, Laura's book on intersections of random walk uh, about the, this potential kernel. The important thing for us is that it behaves like a green function since its Laplacian is zero off the diagonal and uh, minus one on the diagonal. Okay, so that's what this G is, and we'll just keep calling it G even in two dimensions, even though in two dimensions there's another notation that's often used. It's called A in those books. All right, but the important thing here is that this is just a formal solution of this, so minus gamma solves this equation. Okay, that's very standard. You just take Laplace of this and use linearity to get that. All right, but remember, we missed the whole point, which was the free boundary. So here is this measure method of the superharmonic majorant. So let s of x be the smallest superharmonic function, which is greater or equal than gamma. Now, what's superharmonic? Remember, harmonic means Laplacian equals zero. So harmonic functions, the value at the point is the average of the neighbors. <coughs> superharmonic, the value at the point is bigger than the average of the neighbors. <coughs> greater or equal than the average of the neighbors. So that's superharmonic. So it looks like that. I can invert it. Proboloid is one example. So, so what we do, given this function gamma that I wrote to you here, for you here, we look at the smallest superharmonic majorant that's bigger than gamma. Smallest superharmonic function is bigger than gamma. The thing is, we could take this in Feynman pointwise. So we look at all these functions, and at each, and we just take pointwise this in Feynman. And okay, let me show you kind of a rough picture. So here is what happens when we take here gamma is defined, actually A and B are two small disks, but we put a lot of mass on them. So these green functions at A and B have these kind of singularities. And maybe I'll go back to the formula. So again, gamma, gamma was um, right, minus x squared minus, let's see, minus the sum y and a, gxy minus the sum y and b, g x y. And this picture is obtained by using basically this formula, but with two disks, two small disks, a and b, that, but then we put a lot of mass on them so we can see something. So that's the picture of gamma downstairs. And think of this function gamma, and then you try to spread a superharmonic sheet over this. So, 
so uh, super harmonic and where every point is bigger than the average of the neighbors. Well, minus x squared is already super harmonic, and this function away from these kind of singularities, it will look like minus x squared. So the sheet will fit perfectly, except on a compact region. So when you fit the sheet over this, the sheet minus gamma will be compactly supported. Okay? Because this function away from A and B, it will look like minus x squared, which is already super harmonic. All right? So here is the amazing fact, I'm still amazed by it, that we have an exact identity. This is what makes the um, divisible sand pile so nice. We have this exact identity that the odometer is exactly S minus gamma. Remember, gamma is written here, S is the least superharmonic majorant, and the odometer function for the divisible sand pile is exactly, there's no errors, no approximations, no limits, is exactly S minus gamma. Okay? And uh, one reason I like to give this talk is that I can actually prove this claim to you in one page. So, hang on. Um, all right, so proof. So now, all right, so, Odometer, so what we want to prove, so remember S is the uh, least superharmonic majorant, and phi of X, this is S of X, is in phi of X, so that phi is greater or equal gamma, and phi is superharmonic. Okay, and then the claim is that U equals S minus gamma. All right, so now, now I have to be completely precise. I can't ignore anything, even a small boundary. So let M of X denote the amount of mass present at X in the final state. Okay, then Laplace of U is exactly, remember it's the mass received minus the mass emitted, but we started with mass indicator A plus indicator B. We end with mass M of X. So delta U is exactly, M is now this function M of X minus indicator A minus indicator B an exact identity. And because in the final state, no site has mass more than one, it's bounded by one minus indicator A minus indicator B. Okay. Now, what's the Laplacian of gamma? Well, um, gamma is here. Gamma was created so that its Laplacian is indicator A plus indicator B minus one. All right. So if you add U plus gamma, you see that the Laplacian of that is non-positive, which is exactly, remember Laplacian is average at the neighbors minus value at the point, so non-positive Laplacian exactly means uh, superharmonic function. So U plus gamma have Laplacian less equals zero, U plus gamma is superharmonic, and S is the smallest superharmonic function that's bigger than gamma. U plus gamma is also bigger than gamma, because U was non-negative, so U plus gamma must be bigger than S. And that's one half of what we want to prove, right? U, U should be S minus gamma, so we prove that U is greater or equal than S minus gamma already. Okay, and we still have another direction to prove, and we'll fit it in the rest of the slide. Okay, so look at the function S minus gamma minus U. Okay, so this is super harmonic on the set A plus B. Why is that? Because A plus B is exactly where uh, we reached mass 1. So on A plus B, this inequality is an identity. It's a set where points that did get saturated with mass 1. So, so you, Laplace, on A plus B, Laplace in the few equals 1 minus 1A minus 1B. So when we add this, we get exactly harmonicity. So U plus gamma is harmonic on A plus B, and S is superharmonic. So the whole thing, S minus gamma minus U, is superharmonic on A plus B. Okay, stop me if something's unclear. It's superharmonic on A plus B, but it's non-negative outside A plus B, because outside A plus B are points that didn't get sated, in particular, they didn't send any mass out at all. So outside A plus B, U is zero. So outside A plus B, we just have S minus gamma, which is non-negative. Remember, S is bigger than, greater than gamma. So you, now you have a function, S minus gamma minus U, it's non-negative outside A plus B, and it's superharmonic inside. And now it's a version of the minimum principle that says, if you have a superharmonic function, it looks like this, and it's non-negative on the outside, 
It has to be non-negative on the inside. Just look at any proof you know of the maximum principle and you'll see it works to show this kind of thing in the discrete setting as well. So, so this function is non-negative inside. So S is greater or equal than, uh, so, you know, S minus gamma minus U is non-negative. So, uh, U is less equal S plus gamma, which is the other inequality. U is less equal, I'm sorry, S minus gamma, which is the other inequality we needed to prove. Okay? All right, so once we're here, so we prove this, this identity, and now the path is clear to obtain a scaling limit, because we can mimic the same construction in the continuum. In fact, to be true, we did it the other way. We mean it in the discrete case, the construction that already exists in the continuum, but now, given any two sets A and B, bounded open sets in, in the plane, and I need a technical condition that their boundaries shouldn't be too big. Their boundaries shouldn't have positive volume in D dimensions. Uh, now, just follow the same recipe. So define a domain D which has the sets A and B together with the set S bigger than gamma, where gamma is just the continuous analog of the gamma I told you before. Uh, so minus x squared minus, you integrate these green functions. And so again, it solves the, in the continuum the equation Laplace in U equals indicator A plus indicator B minus 1. And, and S is the smallest superharmonic measurement. In the continuum, you actually need to throw in an assumption that phi is continuous. And, and then the statement is that this domain will be the correct scaling limit for the lattice domains we're interested in. So you formally define an odometer, which is this S minus gamma. Um, but it doesn't have for us a meaning as an odometer. It's just defined to be S minus gamma. Okay? So here is this domain S bigger than gamma when you have two overlapping disks, a picture you've seen before. And in fact... I'll already reveal, we know what the boundary here is. It's an algebraic curve of degree four. And this is because in this case, we're connecting to a well-established theory in the continuum, a theory of quadrature domains, where using complex analysis and Riemann mapping, one knows what are the solutions in this case. Um, okay, so the main result of this scaling limit is that if you have these two bounded open sets, you put a very fine lattice inside and do any of these three operations I showed you, the uh, Dicon's photon addition or the rotor rotor addition or um, the divisible sand pile, then in the limit, you will get the domain uh, I showed you here, uh, defining the continuum this way. I really only indicated why this might be true for the divisible sand pile case. And even there, there are more steps to do. So maybe let me skip this. Basically, you want to show that the obstacles converge. The obstacle is this function gamma. So this is just a matter that the green function in the discrete case converges to the disc green function in the continuum, you know, which is connected to the convergence of random walks to Brian motion. So that's been well, well studied. Then you want to deduce from that the convergence of the superharmonic majorants. So that's Basically, that superharmonicity in the lattice sense and superharmonicity in the continuum sense are close. So you have to you know, adapt that. And then uh, there's a delicate point, which is from convergence. So what is uh, the domain? It's the domain is really the support of the odometer function. It's where uh, that's the domain of interest here. But if you have a sequence of functions u and it converge to a limit function u, it doesn't imply that the supports converge because the functions could be, you know, could have you know, large supports when converging to zero. So here is where we use that, we need that technical condition on zero boundary measure for the, um, zero measure for the boundary of A and B, because there is some preservation of volume both in the discrete and the continuous case, and we use that to, to do that last step. So I'm going to skip all the details of that. Now, when you look at the rotor case, there's already complications because the Laplacian of U is no longer exactly one because the, it would be exactly uh, one if the rotor did an integer number of turns. But when it does a fractional number of turns, the number of particles emitted to different sites is not exactly the same. It differs by 
could differ by one, but this difference by one is formally important because when you look at the Laplacian, you get some other value. So it turns out you have to kind of do some averaging over larger domains, some smoothness to recall, to connect to the previous proof. And this is more technical, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, the smoothing. And I said this connects to the topic of quadrature domains. And I'll just tell you, you know, I won't explain why, but I'll tell you this. So what is a disk? Well, a disk is many things to many people, but to uh, perhaps to a complex analyst, a disk is a domain where if you take a harmonic function and you want its value at a point, you can instead uh, average it over the disk. So this almost characterizes the disk. If you also say for a superharmonic function, its value at a point is bigger than the average over a disk, this really characterizes the disk up to measure zero. So if that's what the disk is to you, then you can ask, suppose I want the similar fact that I want a domain where when I integrate the harmonic function over the domain, I'll get the sum of the value at two points. And similarly, if I integrate a superharmonic function of the domain, I want it to be less than the value, this, this sum. Once I put this condition, not just for harmonic, but also the analog for superharmonic, it specifies the domain uniquely. This is known as a quadrature domain. They've been studied intensively since the 70s in complex analysis. A lot is understood of them. And finally, what we understood is that our discrete models are actually converging to these kind of quadrature domains. And so we could use the rich theory of those to understand what are the boundaries of the scaling limits. OK, so there are some open problems on, say, the rotor router. So they told you it converges to a disk. Well, how close is it? So here are simulations up to a million, but now it's gone, it's been done recently up to a billion particles. And you measure the in radius, you know, the out radius minus the in radius, and look, how bad could it be? What's the worst we've ever seen of the out radius minus the in radius? I'm not looking at the ratio, I'm looking at the difference. And the difference has never exceeded two. So it's almost a perfect disk as, you remember, it's a set on the lattice. So it cannot be a perfect disk, but it's almost as perfect as it could be given that it's sitting on the lattice. And, uh, you know, our proofs show nothing like this. So that's one challenge to really, is the uh, is f- error from a disk really bounded for the rotor router? You know, also, when you look at that picture, there are no holes in the picture. But the proofs that are analytic, you know, do not control well what's happening near the boundary. So we cannot rule out analytically that near the boundary there is some hole in the set. But there isn't a hole. So challenge, prove it. Actually, uh, this challenge comes from an earlier talk I gave and Lati Lovas presented the challenge to us and we're still stuck on that. Uh, and then you can change the model a little bit. So for instance, this shell is obtained by making the right half axis a one-sided mirror. So particles coming from the top go down. Particles coming from the bottom also are forced down. And then we get this kind of shell-like picture. No matter if we look at 10,000 or a million or 10 million particles, it looks like the same picture. So there is a scaling limit, but we haven't proved it. Finally, I promised you something about this pattern. So I said it looks like the function root 1 over z. So to do that, see that, let's apply, this is purely empirical, no proof here. Let's apply the inverse mapping. So z goes to 1 over z squared. So you see the outside of the disk is mapped to this little white disk. And this pattern is mapped actually to the complement of the little white disk, but I'm truncating it in the square, and I hope you can see the lattice pattern here. Well, you can see it, but can you prove it? We we can't yet. Um, Okay, and then the last, the last topic I want to mention is the hardest one, the abelian sand file, which at first, I mean, the three models I told you about before all look pretty similar, but also somewhat different. Here's a model which also looks pretty similar but somewhat different, but turns out to be really different. This is the abelian sand file. So, um, so let me quickly go back to the simulation. So, all right, so let me stop this. So in this abelian center, we add particles at the center. And so, so you see, there's the center. And when four particles reach 
a site that has four particles or more than a degree, it topples and sends one particle to each neighbor. So you see, it's very similar to the rotor router. There also, you send one particle to each neighbor. The difference is that in the rotor router, you really insist on cleaning out, leaving exactly one particle at a site, even if you cannot divide exactly equally among the neighbors. In the sand pile, the fairness between the neighbors is paramount. You only send particles out to the neighbors when you can send exactly one to each neighbor. But, um, but uh, so that means that you will have some leftovers, which are 0, 1, 2, or 3 particles. So the colors here represent, uh, you can see the map up here. So the colors represent how many particles are at each site. It's always 0, 1, 2, or 3. And if you look at this shape growing, you might think, well, maybe it looks in the limit like all the other shapes we've seen. So we're not going to wait that long. And here's the shape with a million particles. And, you know, at first we thought, just to say the Sabuvian Sandpal has a rich history. It was invented uh, independently by statistical physicists, notably Bakhteng and Weisenfeld in the uh, 87 and investigated by uh, brilliant Indian physicist uh, Dar and uh, independently invented in combinatorics as a chip firing model um, almost at the same time, maybe a year year later. And um, for about 10 years, it was studied in, independently in the two communities with the same kind of results being discovered until finally the lines of research merged at some point. Um, and you see in papers kind of mixed terminology of uh, sand particles or grains and chips. So be prepared. But um, so this is after one million particles. And at first we thought, well, it's pretty round, but not as round as the water. Maybe we need to add more particles. But what turns out is that this is really the shape in, in, empirically. So if you do 100,000, a million like this, or 100 million, it looks like that. So with it's roughly a 12-sided polygon, but with kind of rounded off edges. And the colors represent how many particles are left at each site. So again, open problem, explain the color pattern. Now here, until about two months ago, there was even not a proof that there exists a scaling limit. But, but uh, in a dramatic development, uh, again two months ago, uh, Charles Smart and Wesley Peng prove that there is a scaling limit, but again, using these PDE free boundary techniques, but in a more refined way than what we did. Um, and because the model is harder, they cannot prove anything about what the limit is. They can, you know, they prove it exists and then they're exhausted and cannot say anything more. So far, they're working on it, I mean, with other, so there, I expect progress on that, but uh, at least we know that what we see, that this shape is the same at different things, it really is, is the case. Um, by comparison to a rotor, we obtain some bounds on this, but I'm not going to dwell on those. Um, and I'm just going to show you, you can change the model by changing the background height. So in the, problem, in the picture I showed you, the background height was zero in the simulation I showed you, but here you could start, say, with background height of two. So every site initially has two particles, and then we add particles at the center. Okay, so let me add more particles at the center. And uh, so every site starts with two, it means that it only needs two more to topple. And it turns out that in this case, it's actually easy to prove that not just the limiting shape, but at any finite time, the shape is a perfect square. This was done by Fay and Reddick, but once it's true at the finite time, you know, you can just prove it by induction, which is what they do, a clever induction. And uh, so we know it's a square when the height is, uh, when the height is two. Um, what happens when the height is one? So, Well, instead of running the simulation, let's go back to this picture. So when the height is one, uh, we'll get this approximate octagon. And again, height is zero, we get approximately 12 sides. 
And actually, height minus one also has a meaning here because you could start every, you know, everyone is in depth. So you need five particles before you topple. And height minus one really leads to a shape with about 16 sides. In general, each time we push the height down by one, four sides get added empirically. And we can't prove that, but the only things that can be proved are the square at a height two. And actually, if you drive the height to minus infinity, you can show you converge to the divisible sand pile. So that converges to a disk. But all the intermediate cases are just, you know, we just have the pictures. Um, so the very final thing I want to show you, let's see. What about, so again, take d equals two in all of this. So uh, for any constant background at most two in, in z2, not only we get the shape, but we know somehow its size would be, uh, diameter would be root n. So this is uh, another theorem that I don't have time to get into. What about if you add more chips? So if in Z2 you start with three particles at every site, and then you add more particles at the center, even you have four particles at the center, three everywhere else, the, it will keep toppling forever. It will never stop. That's a nice exercise to think about. So height three, background height three is too much. Background height 2, you, you get still a nice shape. So with background height 2 and n particles of the origin, you'll get a shape of diameter root n. So the interesting thing, the critical regime is between 2 and 3. But it turns out that it's more delicate. It's not just quantitative. Uh, so since Bella is here, I have to present the next thing, which is related to bootstrap percolation. So suppose instead of height 2 or height 3, you start at height 2 plus epsilon, meaning every site has at least two particles, but with probability epsilon, you put a third particle. And epsilon is very small. However small is epsilon, it turns out that this will, uh, if you then start with a large enough number of particles at the origin, this will keep going forever. And anyone who knows the argument for why bootstrap percolation has critical probability zero will be able to adapt it to prove this statement. Um, but, so, okay, so is 2 the critical value in the plane? Well, not exactly. So here, we're going to start where most, so the green is height 3. Most sites here have height 3, and the red is height 2. So only minority start at height 2. But still, this shape is going to be stable. So however many particles we add at the center here, it will go on for a while, toppling, but it will stop. In fact, the radius will be, if we start with n particles, the final radius will be just a constant root n, maybe a large constant. So the key thing here is that there are these dikes, there are these infinite lines of two, and they eventually stop the progress of this of, of the sand pile. So since I started with 128, you know, it might take a while for this to stop, but, uh, but it does stop. So it's, you know, it's a question, question whether we'll have the patience to, to see it stop. Probably not. So those who want, you know, I'll show and have the 10 minutes to spare, you know, I'll, I'll show it to them later. Let's see. Maybe, maybe it's dying off. Whew. Okay. So it did stop. All right. Now, however, here's another pattern, another lattice. Now there are much fewer greens. So green is height three, and if we and here, if we start with enough particles at the center, this, although the threes have a lower density, it will never stop because this Q lattice has the property that the greens on every vertical line and every horizontal line, there is positive density of greens of height three, and that's enough to keep this process going forever, again, by a bootstrap type argument. So it's more delicate than just the density. The arithmetic nature or the, of the lattice matters as far as the final result. And I'll end with the last mystery, which is dimensional reduction. So the proofs in this business often relate sand piles of different dimensions. Uh, 
but also the mysteries relate sometimes of different dimensions. This is one of the more fascinating ones. So on the right, you see the sand pile. I hope you can see. Uh, so again, the colors represent the number of particles. Dimension two, background height two, and this carefully chosen number of initial particles. On the left, we are running in D equals three, also a critical height of four, so that's two D minus two, and five million particles. And when we do here the toppling, we'll get some shape inside a cube. It will be a perfect cube. We take this cube and we slice it through the origin. And then it turns out that outside the central region, everywhere outside the central region, there is a pixel-to-pixel -pixel match of what we have on the left to what we have on the right. So everywhere the height is exactly the same outside the central region. And, you know, that's verified but completely not understood. Thank you for your attention.